you kind of segued into there your transition from leaving the sports agency world into going to the ICC, becoming the head of the ICC America's region as the regional development manager. You took over from Ben Kavanaugh, who was the previous person in the role who went back to Australia and got into, I believe, basketball. I want to say he was the general manager for the Adelaide Sixers of the Adelaide 76ers, whatever they're called in the National Basketball League <laughs> in Australia. What made you want to pursue that opportunity when it came up? As I alluded to previously, my last question, uh, my last answer, sorry, when you asked me was what sports agency and being a sports agent made me realize was that I was never, I was never concerned about the bottom figure, the bottom line figure. For me, it was my love for cricket to grow, to help people grow in their roles, to help grow cricket that superseded my ambition of moving to ICC. And when I saw the role that was again presented by my dear friend, Ronnie. Ronnie is my mentor. I, he gave me the confidence that, hey, listen, this is what I believe you can do with your eyes closed. And then were his words. You can do this role with your eyes closed. Why wouldn't you consider an opportunity at ICC? And then I took, an, I took some further advice from, again, someone who I respect dearly is Colin Graves. He was the chairman at ECB at the time. And I just sit with him in for a few minutes and take some advice around female agent. He actually gave me some advice when I became a female agent. And then I also shared this job description with my long-term friend as well and a mentor, Wazim Khan, who's been huge to my personal development and professional development in the agency world. And then also through the growth of ICC as a regional manager. And every person who I respected in their role in cricket were very encouraging to take this role. And somewhat I felt, okay, I feel that I think I can do this role. This is a new challenge. And again, went open, went into it very open minded. What can I lose? I still have my agency. So that's how I moved from my agent role to my current role as ICC regional manager. Ronnie Rani, Colin Graves, Wazim Khan, you're dropping an awful lot of names. Is there anybody else you want to name drop on us in terms of somebody no. who, who influenced you and encouraged you to go pursue this sorry, job? Not name drop, but because there's been a lot of people, you know, sorry, I didn't sound, didn't sound, didn't think it sounded so pretentious, but there's been so many people on my journey that have helped, Father Gorsi being one. But these people have been exceptional in their own roles because they didn't have to. They, they took the time to give advice, they didn't have to. They got the time, they took the time to understand there's a newcomer and somewhat take you under their wing, sort of speak. So I think that's why I do mention them because they were crucial to my personal and professional development. And also maybe, maybe if I had not had good influences around me, I would have been still an agent. So it makes me think some days. When you were an agent, Again, a lot of the focus of, of our conversation has been around Muhammad Amir. You said a lot of the other Pakistan players were calling you and wanted representation as well. And so essentially all of your players that you represented were part of the test world, part of the full member world to then go into a, a new part of the cricket fraternity away from the test world, away from the full member world. And again, you said you grew up 1992 World Cup was a seminal moment in your life, wanting you to get into cricket and Imran Khan and all that to go into a world of Bermuda, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, USA, Canada, all these associate countries that a lot of people may not know play cricket, or even if they do, there's not really an awful lot of respect shown to them in a lot of ways. What was that adjustment period like? And what did you know about these countries before you got into the job? And how has your how have your experiences with them changed your perception of what cricket is like beyond the test world? So very much it's as if, and I shouldn't make this comparison, it's as if you've been in a Gucci shop and been looking at Gucci and Louis Vuitton more or less all your life, watching that level of cricket. And then you go into, and don't quote me on this, Peter, Primark. And you're like, okay. But there's some just really genuine, good buy, pieces to buy in Primark, okay? You can get some good brands in Primark. There's exactly. Hey, hey. For prag pragmatic purposes, functionality, that's what I go for when I pick up my clothes. Not not what, hey, look at me. I'm wearing a Peppa Pig, Daddy Pig shirt. I'm not um, I'm not wearing the Gucci anytime it's soon, Farron. <laughs> so I was coming to your Daddy Pig t-shirt. I was just going to use that. 
So you, you work with, and, and the analogy I'm showing, and the reason I say this is because you go from the top of what cricket is, your full member, your World Cup participants, and then you go to your grassroots, where everyone, where people can afford the prices, people can go in and pick something genuine, and there's some genuine good pieces. Anyway, put that shelf, maybe it's not a great analogy. However, going to Bermuda, going to Canada, going to Brazil, USA, I would go as far as saying I absolutely love from the heart, the passion these volunteers and my members do each day to grow the game. And looking at it, every day I would choose the associate members to work with. Every day, every day. Full members, yes, because they've accomplished but the beauty of trying to help a member to get to that status and to that level of what I've always been at, watching, understood, and not knowing, and answering to your question, not knowing what the associate world was. What, it, what are they trying to do? Did they know cricket? I had a lot of my own questions. But what I did find out and what I love mostly about, about this job is going into countries where they are just growing the game. And I'll use this memory of mine is in Belize. And I'm two years ago before COVID hit, I was in Belize. And again, very small, growing, very lower on the scorecard, around about 30, 40,000 on scorecard funding, and really trying to grow the game in a village type setup. And I walk through and there's this little corner shop and they gave me a nice fresh bottle of full fat Coke. I haven't had full fat Coke in a while. And it's warm, it's, it's just humid. And I'm stood there and I thought, and it was just one of those moments where I couldn't, I am so glad and I'm so thankful and blessed that I am in Belize watching this standard cricket game where they are all trying to grow the game. And we're in some fields and it somewhat reminded me a little bit of Pakistan, just the whole uh, third world, very rural, but nothing gave me more joy than to talk to those people and understand what they were trying to do to grow the game. And it's moments like those, Peter, that make me think that I would work for the associate members for as long as I can and help them grow the game because there's true gems out there trying to grow the game for just merely to grow cricket and enjoy it, opposed to be in the World Cup or seeing themselves on TV. It's just the love for it. And that's very refreshing as well, very refreshing. In this modern world of ours, I'm, I'm almost getting a, a tear. Um, the emotion in that interview there. <laughs> it is it's, it's wonderful, but that's why I'm sure you you travel with us and you see some of the tournaments. You just meet some really wholesome people. Salt of the always, earth, salt yeah, of the earth, all the way. Salt of the earth, absolutely. And there's no bigger joy, I think, especially if that's what you're inclined in, and that's the way I, you know, the way I am. It's got to be heartfelt. And some people around the associate world, they work exceptionally hard. And part, in being part of their journey, I mean, I'm irrelevant to them, as I sometimes think, because they're in their country, they're in their own conditions growing the game. Farah says, do this. Farah says, can we have this? This is your budget. Farah says, let's do your strategy. What are you looking at? But when they're down on, their, on the ground doing the day-to-day, -day, the accolade goes to those people. I'm here to support them. And yeah. One more question, then we'll get to the favorite 11. So <laughs> yeah. as, as the head administrator in the Americas, leading all these associate countries and being the head administrator who's also female, who's been a female trailblazer in, in other walks of life prior to becoming a part of the ICC, women's cricket is probably the one area in the Americas specifically that has always been overlooked, not really supported very well. The USA national team program has only existed since 2009. And even in the 12 years, there's not really been much progress. And that is emblematic in a lot of countries in the Americas region. And then you have other examples where Brazil is taking an entirely different approach where they've neglected the men and said, we're going to make women a priority. And the fruits of that are being seen in the T20 World Cup qualifier in Mexico. So seeing the different approaches that countries have taken, what are the things that have stood out to you in terms of models of success that you want to see other countries model their own programs after? And what is the number one thing you would like to see countries focus on going forward that you think maybe hasn't been given enough attention in order to forward not just cricket overall, but women's cricket specifically? It's an interesting question because each country is unique to its own conditions. 
hence Brazil and USA. USA have gone the traditional way, domestic teams, women's grassroots coaches, as well as focusing highly on men, high performance actually. Brazil, completely different. Understood their audience that we have expats, but we don't have any indigenous Brazilian guys who really want to take the sport seriously because there's football, there's rugby. So they turn the model on its head and worked with the women, which has been exceptional for them. As you say, the fruits of the labor are showing now. I believe what I would like to see is, for me, again, it comes from the growth of allowing these school programs to grow for both female and males, but specifically for females to have that at the, as an opportunity at schools. I think when we look at cricket and it's, we, we utilize communities, we can look at high performance, of course, we can get these segregated groups and try to bring them together. For me, it goes back to the basics. Had cricket been an option for me as a child, I think I would have taken cricket. I was netball, I was rounders, um, hockey. But if cricket was given to me on this school curriculum or made available to me at a younger age, then absolutely it would be something that I would have partaked in. I think that's the same with each country. I think what I've been impressed by is different models. There's not one, one size that fits all in this case, as we say. I'm more for growing cricket in their conditions unique to them, opposed to this worked in Brazil. Okay, Argentina, you do the same. Chile, you do the same. It's what works for them. And Chile, for example, we're looking at skill programs. They have a women's team because they're South American championships, but that's just a group of girls who enjoy playing cricket voluntarily. So we've gone back to the school route. Argentina has programs in schools, has a women's team, and have actually been the first member in my region to do a women's cricket strategy as well. So unique to them. And that way we would have, or we would have organic growth of cricket opposed to we need to, as ICC, fix this. ICC America, should I say, fix this. You need to grow the women's game. What I've done also in our region is there's a we call ourselves the America's family and we have a member checking clinic where I, especially with COVID, interact with my members on a regularly monthly basis. We, we pick a topic and we work on that topic for all the members to learn from. Recently has been Julia Price from the USA Women's Head Coach has volunteered as wanting to spearhead coaching for the women in America. So we've set up a forum where other members in the region join the call. I have a young lady in Peru who's passionate about cricket development. She's done her, she's just actually, Peru won an award for doing an online cricket program. She is now spearheading women's development. Sometimes I take the ICC element out of it and let people who are naturally good at what they do on the ground to be able to somewhat influence the members around them. So we, no particular model in this case, it's unique. But the growth of women's and girls, as we, as you probably be aware, we had over the, um, the West Indies World Cup, the Mothers and Daughters program that originated for my region with my um, uh, female colleagues in the regions, in the, mem in the member countries. We created the MAD program, which is the Mothers and Daughters, and so that still goes on in different countries. That still is the icebreaker to bring women and girls on. So various models, I would say, dependent on the region, but definitely the, the focus is around having members be the leaders in growing the game and not ICC mandating this because there's a difference. The, the best way to help is sometimes to just stay out of the way. But the members... help, if you need to help, help, help those help themselves. Yes. <laughs> in all seriousness. And they do a great job. They feel valued. They feel empowered to do so. And it's also... Sometimes because we have ICC America's hats on and we're so we need to do this, we need to do this member. I usually some, some days take a step back and say, what would I do if I was in their position? I wouldn't want ICC up my, you know, do this, do that. I would say, actually, let me do what I have to in my region, in my, mem in my country, my local area, and then assist me as and when I require it. And some of our members are very much competent to be able to do that. And that's where I like to empower them. And again, Peter, you've heard of our Future Leaders Programme. I was very much as part of the selection, looking at the applications, talking to our members, and blown away of how many women and girls globally want to be 
involved in ICC, whether it's administration, whether it's a player, whether it's a coach, just a variety um, of opportunities. And I always try to, if I can, in my region, amplify that and let the ladies take the leadership role in this because they are the leaders in the country. They just need to own it.